No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is the word of the Lord that came to me so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Jesus exhorts you today, do not worry about your life. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. So listen to him. Be confident, patient, and content with what you have and who you are. There it is. That's his word. Done. That's your word for today. Go and do it. Stop being anxious. Don't worry. Be happy. Sermon over. Never mind. <laughs> uh, but it's not that easy, is it? We worry all the time. We are constant, constantly anxious about our lives, what's going on in our community, and what we hear happening in the world. We talk endlessly about the economy and the cost of living and gas prices and taxes. We look to the sky for fear of the next cataclysmic storm. We look to the earth and worry about whether it will yield its fruit in due season. We anxiously wonder about our children, whether they will turn out to be good people. Or we despair that our children will never shape up. We go to work fearful that the boss will lash out at us this day or the coworker will stab us in the back for the promotion. You'll note that the things that cause us the most worry, anxiety, and fear are the things that God promises to give and to protect. He gives them by promise in the creed and in the prayer and then protects them with the Ten Commandments. In the creed, God the Father and maker of heaven and earth promises everything you need for your body. God the Son gives you everything that you need for salvation through his suffering and death. God the Holy Spirit gives you faith in his church to keep you with the Father and the Son today and always. That's his promise. You confessed it. So why do you worry? Why are you anxious? What are you afraid of? The simple answer given by the Holy Word is that we do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That is a harsh word of judgment for our sin and rebellion. We might think that God actually likes accusing us, like some kind of abusive father who enjoys inflicting pain on the weaker than him. We might also think that, that then that God's preachers are like-minded sadists who get off making Christ's flock miserable by always telling them how much they're poor, miserable sinners. We think that the goal, then, by preaching the word, is to drive people away from the church, not back to God. And of course, that would be true if the only thing we preached was what God's law tells us. That would be true if the Father had not also given his son Jesus to die for us and to forgive us for our rejection of him. Without the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified, forgiveness received and given, the law is a bludgeon to kill us and then leave us for dead. But again, the chief reason that God would show us our sin, this is Paul's assertion in Galatians, it was given because of trespasses. The law was given to show us our sin then not so that we are left there for dead, but that they be forgiven. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. His holy law is given that we would see our fear, anxiety, and worry for just what it is, unbelief. We should fear and love God, but we don't. We worry about what the Fed and the bankers will do with interest rates because we fear them. We complain and whine about politicians because we mistakenly trust in them. We despair for the future of our country because we love it and can't let go of it. And so these rule with fear, 
promoted by their demonic agents in the media and the internet and corporations and activists, organizations, and even charitable ch churches. These big boogeymen, our favorites to complain about because we fear, love, and trust in them, wrestle away from God what is only his, that fear, love, and trust. That's just out there, some distant enemy that, yes, intrudes in our life, but arguably we can't really do much about. The commandments drive us instead closer to home. God reveals to us that the enemy isn't just out there, but actually the enemy is our own hearts. We do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We love our bodies to the life of worshiping, or to the point of worshiping them, idolatry. All the gifts promised by God in the creed, which I've already heard mentioned, for our body and our life and our salvation, they become objects to fear, love, and trust in themselves, apart from the one who gave them. So let's say it another way. We take God's good gifts, our body, life, even salvation, and make them an object of worship themselves, rather than the giver of those good gifts, God. So that's why our whole life is consumed with endless fretting about getting more and more of those trifles. We hold on to the gifts so tightly that they become then a curse to us. We fear losing God's gifts. And so then we refuse to love and serve our neighbor. We hoard them for ourselves. We love the pleasures of life, but don't give God the praise for them. We trust in our own efforts to build and preserve the church rather than believing and trusting that God, the Holy Spirit, alone is responsible for preserving the preaching of the gospel and the giving out of the sacred mysteries. But God will not have us fearing any other God, not even the God in our own hearts. He will not let us love others more than him. He will reclaim trust in him for everything needed in body and life. And so he has given us at the nexus between the promises of the creed and the rejection of those promises in the Ten Commandments, prayer. Right between them is prayer, and specifically, the na na and namely, the Lord's Prayer. This and any other prayer grounded in the promises of God and his word is how we Christians return to God in confession and for faith. We cannot pray to God and at the same time, worship wealth, country, life, or whatever else that we falsely fear, love, and trust in. The Lord's Prayer returns us back to God in faith, asking for what he's already promised. We pray, then, not doubting, but firmly believing that he hears our prayers and will well provide them. So we, we ask in the prayer that he put his name on us in baptism and not in any other earthly savior, and that his name would then be on our lips in every time of need, and in praise and in thanks. We ask in the prayer that he, not, that he, not us, preserve his holy church among us by his word and spirit. We ask that God do what he has always promised and wills to do, even despite our doubts. We ask for the daily bread that he gives to all, even without our prayers, even as he does for the birds and the lilies. We ask for God the Father to forgive us for all the ways that we should fear and love him and his commandments, but don't. We ask Jesus to lead us through this valley of sorrow and into the way of life. We ask God to deliver us from all evil, even the evil in our own hearts and in our church and in our workplace and in our community and even in our world. Deliver us. We ask for what we believe God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit alone can give. And that is actually everything. Whatever is needed for body, life, and salvation. How does God work such confidence so that we can actually pray in this way? He says, you will have no other gods. Now, of course, we hear this as an accusation. We should fear and love and trust in God above all things, and we don't. And yet it's also a promise. He will be our God and we will be his people. And the good news then is that he will do this without and even despite us. 
He will be our God and we will be his people. He won't ever leave you or forsake you, even though you wander daily from him through your sin and unbelief. He won't stop his loving care for you, even when you despair of him and wring your hands in worry and hopelessness. He won't stop calling you back into his church to be forgiven, restored, and renewed in the faith, even when you seem to think that the church is all about yours, yours to build, preserve, and grow. He will, daily, tear down every idol in your heart's throne so that he is your God and he alone. And only then, and by his work, can his exhortation be true. Don't worry about your life. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. So as he says, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's Jesus, and all these things shall be added to you. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord that came to me, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life today and always in his name. Amen. Amen.